it's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. Hey there, last week's sequel was Meatballs 3, which was awesome. And I'm so happy we did this film because I got the chance to interview George Buza. George was so interesting. He was a voice actor on a few of my favorite cartoons growing up, Ewoks, X-Men, the animated series on Fox, and the busy world of Richard Scarry. But Mean Gene was a horse of a different color, a really epic color. This movie would be nothing without his character and his role. He was a scene stealer. So without further ado, uh, let's start the interview so you can know how great he is and his behind the scenes stories are also great. I want to apologize, it's the first or second time that I use Google Voice for the interview. It's hard to edit and the timing of it is kind of weird, so sorry if we kind of talked over each other, but you're gonna really enjoy it. Technology is so great. (laughs) (laughs) Are are you on the moon or something? (laughs) Yes, well the moon, if you want to call that New Jersey, (laughs) <laughs> the <moon. laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. Where was that uh, Comic Con that you were uh, recently at? Oh, I was down in uh, Chattanooga. Oh, nice. Yeah, I got to see the Choo Choo. Hey, do you go to a lot of those Comic Cons? No, that was my first one. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I just like to be able to chat with people and be able to find out really what they go, what got them into obviously your career as an actor. And things along the way, so we just basically hit it, hit it like a chronological timeline, and then we'll get to you know the movie at hand. But uh, so where where did uh, your story begin? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Cleveland. Oh, okay. And yeah, and uh, I did a high school play, and it got me hooked. So right I from went, there, right from the right from the well, right from the first uh, first time I said uh, my feet on stage, I went, whoa, this is good. I like this. I could do this, and I pursued and how'd you, it. How'd you, build, how'd you build on that afterwards? Well, I tried to get into every play I possibly could when I was in high school, went around to different girls' schools and auditioned, and I was never out of a part. And then when I went to university, I went to Baldwin Wallace and studied uh, theater arts and acting. And <clears throat> again, tried out for every play I could and just tried to learn as much as I could. Yeah, the more then, you do, uh, the more you can learn, so that's great. Yeah, and uh, learned from some really good people, worked with some really good people, had some terrific opportunities, and uh, eventually I just got a job. I, I did my apprenticeship at the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival. I mean, I, I went at it voraciously. Yeah. And, what and wherever, that, what, what wherever a part would, uh, would take me. And what year was that when you were uh, at the Great Lakes? 1971. Okay. And when you got that first role, again, none of this is always 100% when it comes to IMDb. I don't know if you ever even looked at your own. But the oh, they, first... <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. Somebody's made up my birthday, and I should be <laughs> bent over it with old age. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> well, I'm 67, but they've got me quite older. Yeah, I think they had you... 70? Yeah, they got me in my 70s. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, they have you as your first role. It was uncredited, but they had you, you were on Kung Fu. Oh, no. Okay. Kung Fu was way down the line. My first movie role was in a film called Highballing with Peter Fonda and uh, Jerry. Oh, who was his partner? Oh, jeez. See, this is what happens when you get old, is you forget things. Well, well, not even old, just you were in so many different things. Uh, I have it up, Jerry Reed. Very Jerry Reed, yes. And I played an elevator operator that took uh, Peter Fonda up to some big boss guy. And I had one line. I can't remember what it was. (laughs) How long were you on set? Do you remember that? A day. A day. A day? Nice. Yeah, we got to chat with Peter Fonda, which at the time was really, really cool. Yeah, and then it has right around that time, the first movie when I was going through everything that I thought was really neat, because it was your first, like, name, because that role, your name, your 
the title on there. It says Warehouse Man. But then yeah. after that, you were in Fat Company. Yeah, with David Cronenberg. Yeah. Meatball. One of his. Yeah, Meatball. So it's like fore, foreshadowing for <laughs> down the road. <laughs> that must have been great to work with him. That was like, it was. It was his second, like, major picture. He did a lot of shorts. But, uh, yeah, well, he did uh, Scanners. Yeah. And uh, there was another one that made him really uh, famous. It was a horror Shivers film. Was a, yeah, Shivers, Shivers, yeah. Like a few years before that, yeah. yeah. And then so he did this. His fast company yeah. was completely out of his genre. I mean, he was yeah. doing horror films, and all of a sudden here's this low-budget thriller about drag racing. <laughs> but it was still, I mean, it was a great group of people to work with, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Claudia Jennings was wonderful, and God bless her soul. And, uh, William Smith. There were some good people in that film, and we had a great time. We did a. I'd never been on a drag race circuit before, and all of a sudden we're down there on the track, and the earth moves when those cars fire up. Oh, Being wow. that close was quite the thrill. How long do you remember? Like, was that your first movie that you were on this on set for a long time? I think you're, like, in the top ten built people, so I'm sure you're around the whole time. Yeah, we were there beginning to end. And now, uh, so how did you get into voice acting? I did my first uh, voiceover as a result of working uh, with somebody in theater who knew somebody that was hiring uh, commercial announcers and that, and so uh, I ended up doing a commercial for this person, and they spread my name around. And everybody... uh, pretty much gets a shot at auditioning for these things because Toronto was a real hot place for animation. Yeah, when and did you move there? I came up in 74. Nice. It's beautiful there. I love it. It's just fabulous. You know, it's a little cold sometimes, but climate change should cure that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Edgar Casey had a premonition that Toronto would be a subtropical climate at some point. Oh, yeah? Well, that's too much. When I was there, it was pretty cool. We got married uh, in October 2015 in Niagara Falls. It just me and my wife. And then we went up to Toronto for the, the next couple of days. And uh, it was beautiful. I loved it. Yeah, it's a gorgeous city. But we got snow yesterday. You did? Yes, we did. A couple inches. Whoa. It's pretty much gone by now, but it's not what you want to wake up to. No, you don't want to wake up to snow, especially when it's springtime. Yes. Time to get the bike on the road, not the snow shovel. Yeah. So you said that the the boom was in Toronto for a lot of these... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, there's still a ton of cartoons that are being done here. Chorus Entertainment is one of the number one uh, distributors and producers of animation right now. And that's, uh, that's all done here in Toronto. And there's okay. tons and tons and tons of it. The Ewoks was produced up here, droids, and... Uh, yeah, so those are pretty significant uh, you know, things you were on. So how did droids come about? It was just from that, from the well, name getting passed around, like a reel? Well, you auditioned for all these things. Oh, okay. Everybody had a shot, and the you know, nothing was handed out free. Yeah. You all had to jump through the hoops, and uh, you had to get final approval from uh, Los Angeles. You know, it wasn't just, hey, I know a guy, and then you get a job. <laughs> yeah. Especially when the producers are George Lucas and uh, Marvel Comics. Yeah. Did you, you know, they, they had George a... George Lucas in the room when you were auditioning? No, no, no. You did the... Oh, okay. You sent tapes. Way oh, back okay. then, you did tapes. There wasn't the technology that exists today. Yeah. It was all done on cassette tapes, and then it was sent down there by snail mail or courier, and then they looked at it or listened to it on a tape recorder. Were was you a fan of Star Wars? Were oh, absolutely, Wars? absolutely. I I thought it was one of the best movies ever made. Yeah. And uh, that was a huge. So thing. I thought being it. a part of it, like Ewoks, wasn't done until like '82 or three. <laughs> So it was quite a long time, like several years after the movie had come out. Yeah. Because the movie, I think, was in the late 70s, 77 or 8. Yeah, I think Jedi was... Uh, Jedi came out in 80, I believe. Yeah, but the first one, I think, was in... Was Jedi the first one? No, no, Jedi was the third, Jedi was the one that had the Ewoks. 
Yeah. So they probably just right after that, like, <coughs> done that into it. But no, it's, that's amazing that you were a fan of something, and then the opportunity came up, and you were able to... Well, it happened, too, with X-Men, because I used to read X-Men comic books as a kid. Oh, you did? That's great. I mean, they came out in the very early 60s, which would put me in comic book age. And uh, Yeah. I know I had X-Men comics in my possession, and I know I read them, and I know that they got thrown away. Somewhere? No, they oh, got okay. thrown away. This is why well, I'm no, not so attached to the memory. Yeah. Sounds like my dad we could be doing this. Baseball. If I had all those comic books and baseball cards from my youth, we'd be talking from someplace warm right now. Yes, that's <laughs> sure. Yeah, my dad told me he used to put the baseball cards in the spoke of his tires and said to make. Oh it yeah, sound. yeah. They we yeah. didn't we didn't think that you know forty years down the road these things would be worth a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we used to flip them, we folded them, they carried around in our pockets, pinned to the backs of our bicycles. <laughs> if only they you knew then what you know now. Oh, absolutely. And the comic books were all dog-eared. That's why they're so rare and mint condition because nobody said, oh. If I put this away, by the time I'm an old man, it'll be worth a fortune. Yeah. So when you, you know? uh, were when you were approached or when you were auditioning for X Men, was Beast a character that? How did that come about? So do they have? Do they put out there's specific roles, and then you get those lines, so you read the lines for Beast. Yeah, they give you a, a, a description of the character, and then they give you uh, several pages of lines to read. And then you go into a booth, and there's a director who is going to be the director of the show, and he gives you some direction, and then you do it. And then they record it, and then they send it away, and then people agonize over it, and they come up with a, a yay or an A, and that's the way it goes. And X-Men and you did was that the for same, a while. Right? That was on a long time. X-Men was five years. Yeah. Well, this was our big reunion. That was the whole deal that uh, that got me to Comic Con. Was that they they wrote a book called uh, Previously on X Men, Eric LeWald and his wife Julia, and it was about the whole making of the X Men series and the impact that it had on the industry and people. I mean, it was the number one cartoon series ever on the air. I watched it every Saturday morning. Well, this is what I hear. I mean. The Comic-Con really uh, enlightened me to the fact that this show meant so much to people. Yeah. That uh, all those people that felt that they were different or uh, downtrodden and abused and everything, they identified with that show 100%. And we had them coming up to our table and saying that uh, it was our show that got them through their tough times. They were so moved that uh, we had shown up out of the blue at their Comic Con, and uh, it was really touching. Yeah, because you know, yeah, when you're doing it, I mean, for one thing, you never really meet anybody that's they don't know who you are. You know, that's the thing about a voice actor; you don't know what the guy looks like, so you don't get yeah, recognized. Sure. Oh, there goes the guy that does Wolverine or whatever. <laughs> you know, they, you're anonymous. And you really don't yeah. know what a success or what an impact you have until, like now. I mean, then 27 years later. That's really amazing. When I was crossing the border to uh, go down to the Comic-Con, I was wearing my X-Men jacket, and I told the, the border guard I was going down to represent the 25th anniversary of X-Men. And he started singing the uh, X-Men theme song. <laughs> that is great. Yeah. So he was a fan. That's so cool. You know, wear that more often. That jacket. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to have it for the Comic Con so people could identify that, hey, that's the guy that. That's so amazing. Was there any shows that impacted you growing up that you, uh, like, identified with or were able to. Just well, nothing. I wasn't yeah. ever, you know, a huge fan. I really liked a lot of the old comedies. I loved uh, Sergeant Bilko. Yeah. I loved McHale's Navy. I mean, these are ones that I own now, the DVDs of. Yeah. These were the old series that I thought were just the best. And I Dream of Jeannie and the Beverly Hillbillies. These were all the shows that I loved. Yeah, they still Over hold up. I, watch a lot of the old, I, I still watch a lot of the old shows, and uh, they, they definitely hold up. The, the writing was so phenomenal. 
It was, and and through the course of my career, I've ended up working with several people that had been on uh, these series. I did uh, a mini series called America, where the Russians take over the U.S. It was on ABC back in 1985 or so, and uh, uh, Ivan Dixon was on the show, and we became good buddies. And he was one of my idols. I mean, Hogan's Heroes, son, that was something that my dad and I watched together all the time. So were there any questions you asked him about, like, Hogan's Heroes, or were you able to... Well, you feel soul? kind of awkward about that, you know. No, you're, definitely. Yeah, you don't want to be a fanboy. I mean, you're working as peers. Yeah. I mean, it's just neat that you're working with somebody who uh, you used to watch on TV as a kid. Yeah. I mean, one of the high points of my career was uh, doing a movie with George C. Scott. Oh, wow. I mean, I felt weird asking him, you know, could I have a picture with him? But uh, I had to. (laughs) Yeah. Here was an acting god, you know. And to actually share the screen with him and do lines with him was just uh, an amazing treat. And what movie was that? uh, Oh, it was about the Iron... Guard, what the heck was it now? Descending Angel. Eric Roberts was in it. That's great. What year was that in? I'm trying to. I'm trying to find it. Uh, late '80s, maybe early '90s. Sure, I'll be able to find it. So years later, after doing going back to X Men, so you're able to, you know, be that character through the series, the animated series, for a couple of the video games, and then how did it come about that you were in the movie, in X Men, the movie at the trucker? Well, because there was an audition for some of the smaller parts in the movie, and I went in an audition for it. And one of the people sitting at the audition desk said, you, you realize this this guy did the voice of Beast. And Brian Singer lit up, and uh, they offered me the part of uh, the trucker, based That's on the really fact cool. that I was in X-Men, the animated series. That's really cool that it happened like that. that it was. It was in. really cool. And... Uh, I had a tiny little scene with uh, Hugh Jackman and Anna Paquin, and just being on set was a, a real treat. Yeah, because again, you can never go into to talk in the realm of you know Back to the Future. You can never see an alternate tr- timeline. But maybe if that series wasn't a hit and it wasn't well, that's what they said at the audition. Know. They said if it had it not been for the animated series, this movie would not be made right now. They attributed the success of the series to uh, the uh, the movies. Yeah, because it was only a few years after the series ended. Well, the out. series ended in 97, yeah, and the movie was made in 2000 or so. Yeah. Yeah, so about three years. No, that's great. It's so cool that you were able to do that. And then oh, you were on another is. show. I know, I know kids, you, you talk kids. Sometimes I, I forget that I'm 32, and I keep saying, like, kids. But all those people I came up to at that Comic-Con were probably around my age and older. And oh, yeah. One show that I loved, and it doesn't say what voices you did on the shows, but uh, Busy World of Richard Scary. I was Mr. Gronkle. Mr. Gronkle. Wow. He's a, he's a boar. So amazing. <laughs> that is so cool that that was you. And you did it for the whole... Yeah. That's the whole series, right? Yeah. That's so great. Because, yeah, I grew up on that, and then there was, like, obviously, like, I remember, like, early computers playing games for that uh, that show, and you know, that show was, like, a big, and then you were on Babar. Yeah. All these shows that I, like, grew up watching, which is so cool. We did a bunch of <laughs> anime, too, here. Oh, you did? Uh, Beyblade was done up here. Oh, Okay. I played the old yeah. grandpa character on that one. Oh, you did? <laughs> and so one th- one show, so what I like to do is when I chat with people, I like to go back and look at uh, some of the shows they were on as, like, series regulars. So I remembered X-Men. I remember uh, Busy World of Richard Carey. One show that was really neat is a, a lot of the episodes are on YouTube, uh, Maniac Mansion. That was a hoot. That looked like you had so much fun. The people that are in it. They're all SCTV people, and they brought in these amazing stars from Hollywood all the time. I mean, yeah. imagine they brought in Jose Ferrer. 
Right. Do you know who he is? Sounds familiar. Trying to think. The same thing. Well, you remember Mel Ferrer from uh, NCIS, not NCIS, but one of those cop shows. Anyway, oh yeah, I, I see him. Yeah, that was his dad. His dad was one of the oh, most okay. famous actors from the 1930s and 40s. He did the first movie of uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, and he was brilliant. And uh, he showed up on the show, and they allow he allowed us to put goat legs on him because the whole <laughs> thing was that we had this mutation chamber in the basement, and that's how. Yeah. I ran in there after a ball, the door closed, and my uncle ran in after me. He got turned into a fly, and I went from being a toddler to a giant. Yeah. But still... That's the episode with... I, wa- I watched an episode when the fly, uh, when uh, the main character for Maniac Man, the father. Who was the father on that Joe show? Joe Flaherty. Yeah, so Joe Flaherty was talking to the fly, and the fly was looking at other flies, and... Asking like uh, if he if he thought they were attractive, yeah. And you were like upset that your brother would wrestle with you, and uh, that was really really clever. It was on for a little while, right? It was on for oh, it played for years. years. Uh, it's owned by the Family Channel. That's great. Is it still on? You think it's syndicated? I have no idea. It's a but we met George Lucas because he had a hand in that. It was based on his video game. And for really? one of the episodes, he showed up on set. For uh, it was one of those uh, we we held a rap party and filmed it. Yeah. Like the script was that the show ended and uh, we were having this big party, and George Lucas showed up and he brought the uh, the laser swords from Star Wars with him. So we all got to play with the real McCoy. That wow. was kind of neat. That is really neat. I didn't even know that was a video game. I'm looking at it right now. Came out in eighty seven. Actually, came out on my birthday in eighty seven. Hmm. That is wild. Yeah, so that was like a really neat concept for a show. And then you had an opportunity throughout your career to be on some really cool series. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents Friday the Thirteenth, the series, which I really enjoy it, and Twilight Zone. Yeah, they were all good things to be guests on. Yeah, so amazing how how great they were. I love those standalone shows. Obviously, I love series that have continuing storylines, but when you watch an episode of a show and it has the beginning, middle, and end all within an hour, it's pretty Well, amazing. one of my favorite shows from the 60s was The Outer Limits. Yeah. I watched every episode of that. That and Twilight Zone, I love that. Yeah, I love when the Twilight Zone marathon's on every year. So cool watching all those. There's so many of them are such classics. Oh, and you see some of the biggest stars ever that uh, performed on them. Yeah. Anyone from Shatner, uh, what was the name of his, what was the guy from uh, Bewitched, the husband? He was in the one when the quarter stopped, and he was able to read people, uh, hear what people were thinking, and they were just, they were so good, and they were just so ahead of their time. Oh, I just saw an episode the other day with Jonathan Winters and Jack Klugman. He was basically having a, a pool game for his life. Oh, that one's great. And Jonathan Winters that. was the, the world champion pool player, and Klugman was one of the, the guy that wanted to beat him. Yeah. Excellent episode. Just a two-hander. Yeah. No, no. He is uh, absolutely amazing. Jack Klugman was so great. And uh, yeah, that's such a good one. Yeah, he played – yeah, he was supposed to be – Instead of Minnesota Fats, his name was James Howard Fats. Yeah. That's so awesome that you were able to work on those. Were there any other actors that you remember working with on those that were anybody big? Because I feel like even those shows that... Yeah, on, young enough, um, Tony Franciosa was the one on, uh, I think it was the Twilight Zone. Do you remember what the episode was about, the one you were on? No. The vaguely, but... I think there was some sort of a monster, or yeah, I might be getting confused with another series. Oh, no, it's okay. You were in so many different things. Uh, you can't remember them all. But, yeah, so uh, so I before I talk with people, I watched the movie, and uh, Meatball Story was so great. I can't wait <laughs> to be able to hear your time on that. And uh, Well, 
it was hard to tell the difference between reality and the movie. Yeah. Okay. Because what went on in the movie was probably an understatement of what went on after the filming. <laughs> oh, so it was that. It was. It was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love. I love that mean gene. I love that the, there's a girl in one of the scenes wearing a shirt that says "Nobody's as mean as Gene." Yeah. That was so <laughs> cool. Do you remember how that came about, like that role? Well, again, I auditioned for it. Uh, they had a call, and uh, they were shooting. The, that was in the heyday of uh, Canadian uh, B-movies, when the government subsidized all just for the sake of making movies. And, you know, when you look at the stars that they had, where people went, oh, yeah. I mean, Sally Kellerman, Patrick Dempsey, <clears throat> you know, there were some... Shannon, some, Shannon Tweed? Shannon Tweed. Yeah. You know, there were some real big names in that, and uh, I wonder if the mean gene was a reference to <laughs> her hubby. <laughs> oh, I, were they married yet already? No, they were just uh, seeing each other, I think. It was very oh, early. Okay. Cause, but we had a hell of a lot of fun on that. I mean, uh, there's a, there's an opening shot of the uh, of a trailer sitting in front of the bar. And there was a Harley parked in front of the trailer. It was an early morning shot. Well, that was my bike. And I was in the trailer uh -huh. sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and they decided to get a, an establishing shot of the the scene before we started filming anything. And they said, go, go move that bike. And nobody would go and move my bike. <laughs> I said, no, I ain't touching that bike. He's asleep in there. <laughs> Yeah, they don't want to wake up me and Gene. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it stayed in. But that was another thing. Like, every day on that set was fun. Like yeah. that boat that I got to drive? Yeah. That boat would do 120 miles an hour on the water. And you were you were going 120? Uh, I don't know if I took it to that limit, but... <laughs> I had it so high that the girl who played my girlfriend didn't want to ride in it. She had to get a stunt person to ride in it. Really? Yeah. Where was it? Where was it shot in Canada? Hudson, Quebec. Okay. <clears throat> I thought that movie. I, did, did you did you see the other meatballs before this movie? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I knew people that were in them. They're no, all filmed that's... in the Montreal, yeah. Northern Ontario area. Oh, they all were? Okay. Yeah, just the fact the way that that one started was that they referenced uh, Bill Murray's character. Because you bought it from Bill Murray, Tripper. Yeah. Right at the beginning. Yeah. No, that was really... No, that was great. Do you remember how long that shoot was? Because you said there was a lot of partying going on. Were you able to still... Were they well, able it was to about... Uh, time? It was about six, seven weeks. Something like that, I guess. When was the last time you watched it? <clears throat> oh, I can't even remember. Years ago. Yeah. Because it's not out on DVD. I it's on on VH, It's on uh, VHS. Yeah. To be honest, it's, it, where I watched it, it was it was on YouTube for free. Yeah, it's played on TV before in an edited version. No boobies. Yeah, that'd be a lot of editing. <laughs> well, there weren't that many. No, there were a couple anyway. of gratuitous flashing scenes, but generally there wasn't a lot of boobies in that. Yeah. There was a wet t-shirt contest. Are, yeah. <laughs> and those were what was great with growing up, and there was those movies like in the Porky's realm, like you knew what you were getting when you watched it. But this Oh, was, yeah. Gratuitous yeah, was, nudity. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> uh, like you mentioned, the people that were in it, and, and the reveal at the end that, you know, Shannon Tweed wasn't, what that she's my sister. What? Yeah. And you chasing back to Dempsey around and Oh, that scene the scene of chasing him around the room and trashing the place was a hell of a lot of fun to shoot. Yeah, you're able to your head was trash the, the joint. You, yeah, you're punching everything, yeah. I know. <laughs> Ripping the sink off the wall, throwing it through the floor, crashing through a glass door. No, <laughs> these were all fun things to do. <laughs> oh yeah. 
Definitely. I'd love to be able to do that if I didn't have to pay a security deposit on my yeah. <laughs> But, but you know, I, I don't know, again, this would be more for like a director or producer, but I wonder budget wise, because Sally Kellerman was a pretty big, she was pretty big still then. And she, yeah, yeah. I have no idea what the budget was. It could have been a few million that, dollars, maybe eight, maybe even eight million. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't see it listed anywhere, but no, Sally Kellerman was so great, and her role in the movie, I thought that was really clever and funny. To again, you can't have the movies be exactly the same as the other one, so this one was pretty cool because it wasn't like the competing against another camp. It was really, it was just the whole thing in the movie was, it was about getting Patrick laid. Dempsey, yeah, it was about Patrick. Dempsey it was about laid. trying to get back to Patrick Dempsey laid. Yeah. And if anybody can last more than ten seconds in your in your sister's room before you threw them out of the, yeah. threw them through the wall <laughs> through the roof into the water. Yeah, I remember so, the, uh, the gag. The they had a blind guy and he says, "I can't see, I can't see." I didn't look, says, but the dog did. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> So what did you think in the movie, like, after you saw it? No, oh, I thought it was a hell of a lot of fun. I still think it's pretty funny. No, it definitely is. And Patrick Dempsey was, I wonder, would, do you remember what, what year you, the movie was filmed? 1982 or three. Okay, because it came out a, a few years later, so I think it, maybe they held on to it for a while, and I don't know. Yeah, if, they did. It sat on a shelf for a bit. Yeah, because it kind of reminds me of what happened with... Uh, like Teen Wolf, like Teen Wolf was filmed, and then I guess maybe somehow they might have known that Back to the Future was coming out and that was going to be big, because that got released afterwards. So I was wondering if maybe Back Well, they look for a distributor. you got to find a distributor. Not all films yeah. are made with a distributor already lined up. Yeah. And so they might have look, been looking around for the best deal they could get. No, that's true. And it was also in the heyday of all these Canadian films being released, and it was a genre of, can we still make money on this kind of silliness? Yeah, no, that's true. No, just at the end of the at the end of the credits, it says introducing Patrick Dempsey. Yes. So I was just wondering maybe if he was in something that was. I think that was his that first big in. role. Yeah, it was. Yeah, he was in a fast. I never knew this before, but there was a Fast Times in Ridgemont High TV show, and he was in that, like, around the same time the movie got released. But, yeah, no, that was a really fun movie. I loved your character. I actually want to get one of those shirts made. I thought that was pretty funny. Nobody is as mean as Jean. I just thought your character the whole time, every time you came on screen, whether it was, you know, you eating the glass to intimidate him or... (laughs) It just seems all the – every part that you came on screen, you were either giving somebody the business or really just ripping into Patrick Dempsey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wrote him pretty hard. Yeah. My favorite scene was when I took the boat with him in it, or give him a lift and go out to the lake halfway. He says, well, this is as far as I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember how it was working with him? It was fun. Yeah. He was a hoot. I loved it. Yeah. It was good when you hear great stories about people. Like there was that. nobody there that uh, we had a problem with. It was, everybody got along fine. Everybody had a lot of fun. As I say, the difference between filming and uh, and the partying was was a real fine line. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was blurred. Uh, yeah, was Gene Simmons ever on set? Uh, not that I know of. I never saw oh, okay. him. I was wondering what chance we'd be in on there. Well, Shannon was. Great. Shannon kept to herself. She hung around a lot with the producers and the director, and she didn't come partying with us. She was a party with, yeah. <laughs> Wherever she was, she was with some some other people, not us. It was yeah. And Sally didn't party with us. You know, they were all into their own whatever it was. But uh, we only got together on the set. We eat together at lunch, but then. Uh, uh, when this when the day was done, I think everybody else went off to do their thing. And I was living at the time with uh, <coughs> the art director of the show or the set decorator, Mark Freeborn. Oh, okay. And uh, he rode a Harley too. 
And the two of us rented a house, or the company rented a house for us that was very close to the set, right on the water. You know, just literally a half a mile down the the river. And it was a 175-year-old historical house, one of the very first ones to be built in that area. And uh, we were, that was party central. <laughs> no, that was, that was where everybody went to. Yeah, most of the people came to our place and party darty and I remember the uh, the front door was at the same level as the the sidewalk and we just kind of rode our bikes right into the living room. <laughs> <laughs> now, for this movie was there a big uh release? Not like, that I can remember. Like or anything? Oh, okay. I think it just finally came out. But uh, oh, I don't yeah, remember yeah. there being any big gala or anything. Yeah. It was funny. I'm looking at it right now to see if there was anything else, like, on Wikipedia. And one of the things on here, it has Caroline Ray. It was her first movie. She played – she was just one of the girls on the beach. She was beach girl number four. Yeah. It's pretty funny. So she might have been party at Party Central. No, the extras didn't come around. Oh, okay. And then – these we were we were playing with the locals. <laughs> oh, these are the locals. Nice. Yeah, we and we had a few parties on the set. Uh, I think we had a big party toward the end of the shoot, but I don't really no, remember a lot of those other people on the set. I don't remember partying very much with them. Yeah, yeah, that's great that you had a great experience with it, especially that you had an almost like Caddyshack esque uh, filming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> while you were doing it. And it, and it produced a great movie. It was fun from beginning to end, and uh, you played a classic character, so it's not like you were just somebody that was there. And I only, to be honest, I only reach out to people that I really enjoy them in the movie, and uh, thank you for that. And thanks for taking the time. Well, thanks I, I for bringing the memories it. back, because... Oh, don't worry. And I, now I have to go look at it again. Yeah. yeah, you should watch It's on YouTube for free, so check it out. It's pretty yeah. decent quality, I guess. But uh, just a few more questions before you go. Just three. What was the, your favorite acting role that you ever had? Uh, well, I'd have to say the uh, it was playing the next door neighbor uh, on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, uh, the, the show. TV That's series. Great. Yeah. Working with Peter Scolari. It was two of the best years of my career. It was fun every day. Got to work with some really tremendous people that uh, were excellent in their comedic roles. Again, uh, Peter was fabulous. It was a uh, it was a great experience. And again, it, everything that he invented blew up in my face. Yeah. So every week I'd get slimed, wet, all kinds of horrible things would happen. And, so you look on the script or show up, and you'd be like, oh, look, what's going to happen? Oh, to good. I get to stand in front of an air cannon again, <laughs> melted with mushed up vegetables <laughs> and slime. I had uh, a bowl of spaghetti explode in my face and all kinds of messy things. What's your favorite, it's like a two-parter, what was the, your favorite cartoon character that you were? Well, that would have to be that? Beast. Beast takes it. Yeah. Well, was there any signature line or that you would say that, like when you were at the Comic-Con, were people, were there any lines that you guys say that people were like, oh, that's... There's a chapter in the book that had beast lines. Oh. Like they were, they had a, a a guy who would just look up obscure quotations and insert them into the script that were appropriate to the scene. So if there was some sort of a, a thing happening in the action, they would try and link a quotation pulled from some obscure literature and attribute it to Beast. I don't remember very many of any of them, yeah. quite frankly, but people would ask certain quotations that I signed their pa paper or whatever they had, their toy, with yeah. the quotation. Was that I listened to a few idea? of them before the, uh, the Comic-Con just so I would have a reference. And one of the ones that was easy to remember was when the, I'm being led away uh, as a prisoner, and this uh, woman tells me to do something, and I tell her my name is not my name is Mr. McCoy, ma'am, not Blue Boy. 
She called me Blue Boy. With faint heart, averted feet, and many a tear, in our opposed path to persevere. A minor poet for a minor obstacle. I think, I think you touched on it before when just how surreal it was that you touched so many lives and people would, like, watch your show. Did you have any inkling that that would happen? Like no. Any... No, I knew we were doing well because that we were a well-liked show because we went five years. Yeah. You know, for a show to be renewed every year for four years in a row, that meant that you were a success. So we had no yeah. question that people were watching. But the impact that it had and, and how people used that to uh, make whatever problems they had seem less, that was not a... I didn't know that until people told me about it at the Comic-Con. I was given a little bit of a, a an intro to it because I read the book that Eric wrote, and he mentioned that in the book that a lot of people found this show to be their escape from whatever was tormenting them at school or in their jobs or wherever, that uh, they identified with these characters so strongly that it got them through some difficult times. And, and then they all came up to our table and uh, and told us that. And uh, they brought their children with them and then said, you know, hey, this is the guy that does Beast, and this is the guy that did Wolverine, and these are the guys that helped me through whatever, and... You'd meet their kids, and some of their kids already knew the stories because their dads had uh, played it for them, and they watched the, the DVDs. So it's gone through generations, yeah, which is really, yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Especially, like you said before, when you were doing it, you're just doing it. You don't know what's going to – how many years ago is now? Well, it's, it's 27. 26 years, 25? Yeah. Crazy. It's truly amazing that you have that and you're able to make that impact. Now, here's my last question. So what is one movie or show that you've done over the years that you feel didn't get a lot of credit, but when, you, when you're either done filming it or looking back on it, you're like, man, that was really good. Well, The Adventures of Sinbad ended prematurely. I think we could have got done another season or two of that. And that was filmed down in South Africa. Oh, wow. That was some of the most exciting. I mean, that was the hardest work because it was an action show. So you were constantly in motion. There was very little of just sitting down and chatting. There were sword fights every day, and you had to learn them. You had to practice them, and the swords were heavy, and uh, the hours were very long. But still, to be able to work in that environment and to be uh, on the continent of Africa and see all the, the wildlife and be in the nature there, it was it was spectacular. And what I never saw it before. What uh, what what channel was that? A Canadian show? Or? No. Well, it was a co-production between Canada and the U.S. The guy that was the American producer did Baywatch. Oh, great! David Gerber. It's available on DVD, I think. Yeah, I'll look it up and check that out. That sounds pretty cool. So you're able to. It was a great series. It was really good. And one of my favorite movies. Uh, it's a horror film, and it just came out a few years ago. It's called A Christmas Horror Story, and it's a rather uh, un, uh, a different version of Santa Claus. And you're Santa. Oh, I was Santa, yeah. Wow, look at that cast. You got the William Shatner. Yeah. How was that working with him? I had one day with him. He was a gem, an absolute oh, okay. gem. Very, very nice man and a great actor. Absolutely fabulous. And was I was Santa bad in this movie? Oh well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might say so. <laughs> How was working on a horror film? Was this your first? I'd worked on or? one before, back in 1988 or so. It was called The Brain. Okay. Oh, okay. And I just did an interview not long ago for The Brain because they're re-releasing it on Blu-ray. Oh wow! Seems it's become somewhat of a cult film. And out of the blue, I got this email from a guy saying I'm doing a uh, a piece on the brain. And uh, would you care to do an interview? And uh, I did. And he said uh, it's being re-released on Blu-ray. Oh, that's so, great! What a surprise! It's kind of creepy. Look at the movie poster right now. It just looks like a giant. It's a giant brain. It's a giant brain that eats people, and it ate me. Check that out. It ate you. <laughs> <laughs> That was a spoiler. I gave it away. 
Well, I'm sure most, usually in these usually in these horror movies, most people get eaten by that's right or killed by the bad. The bad guys <laughs> always get get eaten by their own creation. Yeah, no, but that's great. I'll check that out. I love uh, growing up. There was a you know people listening to this might not realize that there was this place called a video store. I had one down the street from me growing up, and I used to be able to rent movies for. I think it was like ninety nine cents or fifty cents in the summer, and uh, just to ride my bike there, and I would just go up and down the horror section and just watch obscure ones, people that pe- ones that like were the big name ones, but they're so fun. I don't know. Well, there's nothing like the horror films from the nineteen fifties. The Blob, The Thing. Yeah. It came from the Black Lagoon, the creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, the Attack of the Crab Monsters. I watched all of these. Yeah. That's what I grew up on. I used to go to my grandparents' house on Friday night. There was horror film night. And I'd stay up. It came on at midnight. And I'd get to stay up and watch one of these scary movies. There's some cool grandparents that they they let you do that. Yep. So it's great that you were able to be in horror movies down the road. So you had such a connection to them. Christmas Horror Story is a really good film. Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. That actually got an 80% rating on the Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I will check that out. I'll put that in my collection. We have a newborn, so sometimes I'm up late at night. So uh, while, she, while I'm feeding her, she's sleeping or tossing and turning. But, no, I'll check it out. I think you'll hey, like George. it. Yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll shoot you an email. After yeah. I watch it. But uh, this has been great. I really appreciate you taking the time. No, uh, no, it's cool. it's a lot of fun tromping through the yeah. past. Yeah, I know. You, the stories about the, on set of Meatballs 3 were great. And, no, just that, and especially the timing of it's so great that you were able to share that story that you had when you were at Comic-Con with all those fans that you had that, like you said, there's ever a fate put to a voice actor, but they were able to see that. And so it gives you some really cool memories from all that work that you did. Yes, it does. And it makes us feel good that uh, people appreciated what we did and that what we did meant something to them. Yeah. And I, I appreciate think that's the best, being... the best reward. Yeah. And I can tell you that people are going to watch me fall three and they're going to fall in love with Mean Gene because my character <laughs> is so much fun. George was so great. I'm mailing him a custom t-shirt I had made uh, that says, Nobody's as mean as Gene. I have one already, so follow our, our Twitter and you can see it, at sequels only. George, if you're listening, it's on route to you. Well, I put George's IMDb in the episode notes so you can check him out. Some more and other work he did. And also check out The Brain and Christmas Horror Story. He recommended those. And now the trailer for next week's movie. 16th century Japan. Brave men ride into battle. Fighting an evil emperor. With their only hope. A golden scepter that can open the gates of time itself. Now, in their darkest hour... Come four brave fighters from another time, another place, another species. You were expecting maybe uh, the Adams family? They're back, and they're back in time. Hey, Adams, check it out! We're in Shogun! Once before, demons defeated my ancestors. Now they've come back for me. Talk about your quantum leap! My cannons can destroy these monsters, my lord. This doesn't bode well. I love this stuff. How are we gonna get home? Somebody dial nine one one. I have a feeling we're gonna be here for a very long time. This is the worst rescue I have ever had. I think I swallowed a frog. I hope it wasn't an ancestor. New Line Cinema presents Allegorama. Sweet. 
the four greatest turtles. Hey, all right. Eh? It's not just a job, it's an adventure. Ever to go down in history. It's just your ordinary uh, time travel equal mass displacement kind of thing. Kids. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Help, I'm a turtle and I can't get up. Okay, so I'm going to be honest, this was a rough one. I, I liked it as a kid. It was still fun to watch, but the interview we have after with Matt Hill, who played Raphael, the suit actor, and then went on to do the voice of it down the road, he was worth it all. The movie's still fun. You'll see that we kind of still have fun with it. So s subscribe to us so you don't miss out on that interview. Tell your friends about George, how epic he was. Because I'm sure they'll love these stories. So write us a review, please, and follow us on Twitter at Sequels Only. Good night. Uh -huh.